science fans, and welcome to Sciencia. Our topic for today are poster presentations. When we think of posters, what most of us would imagine would be large printouts filled with pictures and action that advertises films, shows, or even concerts. Scientists and researchers, however, make their own posters too. What show posters and research posters have in common is that both should be able to convey as much information as needed to get the audience interested in a limited space. Both types of posters would need to pique the interest of viewers, but scientific posters must also present data cohesively and maintain credibility. But what really is a research poster? Research posters summarize information or research concisely and attractively to help publicize it and generate discussion. The poster is usually a mixture of a brief text mixed with tables, graphs, pictures, and other presentation formats. But before we talk about what should be in a research poster, let's talk about what should not be in a research poster. If you look at this poster, it's actually not so bad, in the sense that it still is informative and follows a clean three-column layout with most of its content properly aligned. But the poster does not look appealing because of the intimidating, boring grayness of the whole thing. It does not feel dynamic, and it looks like it will take a long time to understand. Let's look at certain portions of the poster in close-up. If you look at this upper portion, abstracts are actually very rarely needed in poster presentations. Not unless required by the conference, it is not that needed because the scientific poster is already the shortened version of the research. For this portion, the too small font size and the obviously crammed information makes it look like the authors did not take the time to discuss and work on the highlights of the research. Nobody is expected to present everything that they have to about their research in a poster. And that's why you should also be always standing beside your poster so that when people have questions about it, you would be there to answer their queries. But before you open that software, whether you favor Photoshop or PowerPoint, Let's talk about some preparatory steps first. When planning for a poster presentation, you must first identify what is most important and what is most interesting about your research. The reference of what is important or interesting is not the same for any conference. If you are attending a developmental biology conference, then you should highlight the changes involved as the organism grows up. As you go through your research, identify key information that must be highlighted to help your audience understand. First, the background of your research, the reason behind your doing it, and of course, your objectives. Second, highlight what you did to achieve your objective, which generally refers to your methodology. And third, focus on what your results imply. Once you have those important information figured out, you can then decide the best means to convey that information to your audience. You can use a combination of text, graphs, or even pictures in your poster. The goal is to keep your poster simple and your text brief. A viewer should get what you're trying to say in 30 seconds. You can provide in-depth information through discussions or even a handout that you can give out. Once you have everything figured out, you can then work on the content of the elevator pitch that would accompany your poster. Remember the characteristics of an elevator pitch. It should be about one to two minutes long and memorable. It should complement your poster, but it is also your opportunity to put in things that are not in the poster. Because as much as possible, you do not want to be redundant. Now that you have your content planned, let's dissect what makes a good poster. The important aspects of your research, such as your title, your objectives, your hypothesis, and graph labels, should be visible from 10 feet or 3 meters away. To ensure this, 
when you're preparing your poster, always zoom in to 100% and step away from your screen at about 3 meters away. If you can read it, then you're good. No matter what font style you use also, make sure that your smallest font size is at least 14. Remember that your title is not supposed to be an essay. Make it short and sweet and direct to the point so that you're easily memorable. If you look at the two examples above, which do you think you can remember more? The second one has less words, but it also makes use of less jargon, thus making it a little bit more understandable, even for people who have different fields of study. Avoid using too many words. Also, you will not impress anyone by using too many fancy terms as well. And remember, hashtag TLDR. Try to limit the use of text, excluding the title, table, and figure labels to 300 to 800 words. Use layman's terms as frequently as possible and use bullets, numbering, and headlines to make your text easier to read. References are not always a requirement, but if needed, put in at most only the top five most important references. When laying out your poster, keep it simple and clean. No use of archaic font style, please. And you also don't need to use calligraphy or fancy Photoshop pictures. Create a grid to make sure your text and images are aligned. Stick to a simple color palette that would print nicely, even if you decide to go to a cheap print shop. Make sure that your contrast is clear. A light background in a dark colored font is the safest choice. Make sure to put in your name and contact information so that people who are interested in your study would have a way to contact you. Make sure to give credit where credit is due, including your advisor and those who help you complete your research. If your research is funded, an acknowledgement section is a must and make sure to find out if they have recommendations on logo size and placement. Now let's look at some examples of what you should and should not do. This poster is nice and clean. It does not look intimidating, so even if your viewers are in a rush, they could actually pause and look at it. Note that the hypothesis is highlighted. The methods, instead of being in paragraph blocks, are in flowchart form. The data is presented in graphs, but it would help if the R value or other statistical measures were included. The graphs could have been made smaller to give more space to the discussion. Now in this case, this poster for the most part is also clean, except you will notice how cramped the third column has become. Some of the references could have been omitted and the conclusion simplified. The data here, however, shows how you can present so much information in a limited space without being overwhelming. The choice of colors for the graphs are simple, but they're also not the default colors in Excel which makes you think that the authors put in a little bit more time to refine them. Nothing too fancy about this poster, but it's simple and memorable. The title is catchy. The amount of text is balanced across the different parts. The results flow well and how it is presented makes it easier to understand. The discussion has the highlights highlighted. So out of the three, this is actually my favorite. I hope you were able to learn something from this short video that could help you in your upcoming poster presentations, whether online or face-to-face. -face. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions, please don't hesitate to contact me, your resident Filipina scientist, in the comments section below. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and also subscribe to this channel. Thank you very much and see you around!